I'm David Morgan. I'm the Chief of Archaeology and Collections at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. And we're out here at uh, the state historic site Los Adais, which is a, a late 18th century colonial Spanish fort and mission where Steve DeVore from the Midwest Archaeological Center of the National Park Service is hosting his 19th annual course on geophysics. And what we're doing is we're using a variety of instruments that rely on principles of geology and physics to try and locate archaeological features without having to disturb the earth. Steve has assembled about 10 different instructors and he has about 18 or 20 different participants here that we're hosting for classroom activities at the National Center and that we're using Los Adice as a field training site out here. And it ranges from everything from uh, powered parachutes flying thermal cameras to uh, ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity, conductivity, magnet, uh, magnetism. We're essentially using all of the things that we can borrow from earth sciences to try and image things below the ground without actually having to dig. I'm Stephen DeVore. I'm an archaeologist with uh, National Park Service's Midwest Archaeological Center. This is part of uh, a workshop that we've been putting on on uh, archaeological prospection uh, using a variety of different kinds of geophysical tools and other types of remote sensing to have an idea of what's under the ground uh, prior to doing excavations or in, in lieu of excavations. In the long run, uh, getting the information out to people that you know these things cover, we can cover a substantial area. I can do with uh, some of the magnetometers, um, you can cover six to ten acres a day. Uh, if you go just to shovel testing with a crew of three, which would be a, basically what a, a geophysical crew would amount to, um, I don't think you can shovel test that much area in one day and be able to deal with all the material that you're coming up with. As a matter of fact, I feel certain you can't. In excavation, in order to excavate, you're removing stuff out of the ground. If you don't keep good documentation on what you're doing, then you're going to lose that, that information. And with the geophysical information, we're not removing anything from the ground. We're just basically looking at what's buried in the ground. We're looking at the physical properties that they represent. Now, sometimes the interpretation may get, you know, we may have problems with that. It may not quite be what we thought it was. But again, the data is there. Other people can look at it, and they can come to their own conclusions. Um, it's fairly cost effective. We can cover large areas in a short period of time now. You can process it. You can have it available. You know, overnight, next day, you can come back out with the field with what we've done in a week's time, and it's all, all in one map. So you can see what's going on. You can actually then ground truth it, check spots, see what those things are, um, what those anomalies are, what kind of features might be showing up. And it helps them to further interpret the rest of the site. I work at Minnesota State University, Moorhead, in Moorhead, Minnesota. Hopefully, if we have some nice anomalies that the surface surveys are finding, hopefully we'll choose a few and um, put the downhole down into those anomalies and get some information on um, vertical extent. You know, where do they start and where do they stop? And that's more, we won't have that information just from the surface surveys. We'll have a location. Uh, we'll get some information on whether there's layering within them. If we put some downholes close together, we can maybe get some horizontal extent and we can say something about the strength of that anomaly so that it, we could compare it potentially to other ones across the site or to other sites and kind of have a signature of something to look for. We could even model what, say, a magnetometer would expect to see if they went over an anomaly like that. So we could get a lot of information that would help us interpret those other surface surveys. We often see layering in archaeological sites, cultural layers, house floors, occupation layers. Uh, we see layering in soils and different horizons and it turns out this property is pretty sensitive to a lot of environmental variables like climate and time, um, people, how they affect the soils. and. Um, so there's a potential to learn about those things by studying this property. So yeah, when we look underground, it hardly ever is homogenous. It'd be a pretty easy problem for geophysics if it, if it was. It often is layered. And so it's good to know that, to know how that affects other methods and just to learn about that. You know, archaeologists are all about stratigraphy. That's what we record. We want to know that layering. Um, I'm Andrew White, and I'm the 
Greater New Orleans Regional Archaeologist, so I'm affiliated with UNO and also the Division of Archaeology Regional Program. I wanted to come to this training seminar because working in an urban environment, I wanted to see what types of options I had for remote sensing equipment, what types of things were useful in an urban setting that had deep deposits and very complicated deposits, multi-component sites, so I wanted to see what options I had in terms of all the different types of equipment, but you never know where you'll end up in the future, so it's always good to have a interest and knowledge about all these types of things so you know how to talk to people who might you might hire to do these types of things. Um, Doing out here what I think is really cool is it's almost like a exhibition except it's at a really cool archaeological site so we can go around to all the different vendors and different remote sensing operators and talk to them about their equipment, how, um, what are the price ranges of some of these equipment, how, what they do, where they're, what sites they're good at, what sites they may not be so good at and you get to see and actually use the equipment so I think that's kind of neat and seeing how it will work and how functional it is in a real live field setting. <laughs> So far, actually, I've found the ground penetrating radar to be pretty useful, especially they can give you what's called t time slices or depth slices, where you can actually see the different deposits. So I think that's kind of neat and might be something that's very applicable to the type of environment that I work with as an archaeologist. Well, I think in addition to learning about all the different remote sensing technology, you also get to meet a lot of people, and I think that's always a, a plus. You get to make connections, and I think that is a benefit as well, and it makes it more fun, too. And I work with the Louisiana Division of Archaeology, which is part of the Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. The work that I do with the Division of Archaeology, there's a lot of uh, research that goes on in uh, advance of development. It's called contract archaeology and it's required by federal and state law. And increasingly use of remote sensing or geophysical techniques are uh, important for uh, archaeological sites or planning how to study and preserve archaeological sites uh, and so I needed to familiarize myself with these various techniques and technologies and so when I encounter them with people doing them I'll understand uh, how they're doing them and if they're doing them uh, correctly and sufficiently. Uh, my name is Chris Lock here and I'm a lecturer in archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology University College London. came on the course as a student five years ago uh, and enjoyed it so much I managed to persuade them to invite me back as an as a, um, instructor and I've come back every year since so it's, uh, it's a bit of a busman's holiday but it's, it's uh, good fun. Yeah. So I teach resistance survey um, which is a, a method that uh, works by passing electric current through the soil and measuring variance in the, in the um, resistance to that electric current which you can then plat, plot as a map to give you plans of walls and ditches and so on. Um, that's the technique I mainly use on my sites. But they should have a really good feel for the variety of different techniques that are available, uh, their strengths, their weaknesses, uh, when you would use them, um, how much they cost, uh, realistic appreciation of what you're going to get out of it. Uh, the downside of programs like CSI, you get this picture of a skeleton in the GPR data. GPR data never looks like that, you know, it's completely sort of full. So, uh, you know, a realistic appreciation of what the techniques can do, um, the sorts of situations when you can use them and that sort of thing. And then to, to know um, either to know enough to then investigate one particular technique if they want to do it themselves or even just to commission somebody else to do and be talking the same language with a, with a, a specialist um, so they get the right technique for the, for the right sign. Um, firstly I get to see lots of bits of technology that I wouldn't normally see in my sort of daily round of things. I've never been anywhere with so much kit in one place before you know and, and uh, because people bring their latest equipment I get to see the latest models and things so it's, it's a really easy way of me keeping keeping up with developments in the field. Uh, the other big thing I get is just meeting lots of like-minded archaeologists who are interested in this stuff and being able to talk to them about problems and show them things I've been doing and then show me things they've been doing. Um, and just fun of doing it actually, I, I, I quite enjoy this week. Thank you.